Welcome everybody uh, to the Afronomics Laws uh, third uh, webinar. Uh, this one focuses on intellectual property rights, global rules, regional and local realities. Uh, we are delighted to have you all here. Um, my name is James Gedi. I'm an editor on afronomicslaw.org and a professor of law at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. It's also providing this technology platform. So thanks, uh, Nick and Julia, for uh, for that. I'll soon turn this over to our moderator, Dr. Titilayo Adebola, in a minute. I uh, just wanted to say that the overriding purpose of this webinar series is to have a discussion about issues of international economic law uh, of concern to the peoples and the countries of the global south and the international economic order. And the mission is to make sure those issues are not uh, forgotten or relegated and to network and connect with all of you, policymakers, academics, activists, well-wishers, friends, about all the work that you do on all these issues every day. Um, uh, just a couple of other things. The uh, chat function is going to be open for about the first 10 or so minutes at the beginning of this webinar. So if you'd like to give a shout out to someone, you're welcome to do that. It will also be open towards the end. Of course, all your questions and answers, uh, uh, all your questions uh, can be typed in the question uh, box that you see at the bottom of your screen. And those are welcome throughout the webinar series. I'm looking forward to this conversation. And now I'm delighted to introduce my co-editor, Dr. Titilayo Adebola, uh, who teaches at the University of Aberdeen, where she's the theme coordinator on intellectual property rights. So uh, Dr. Adebola, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, James, for the kind introduction. Intellectual property rights are complex and contingent, often time-limited, straight-granted private rights developed through negotiations between state and interested non-state actors. We can divide intellectual property into three broad categories, industrial property that covers patents, trademarks, industrial designs, geographical indications, copyright and allied rights, or suge and sui generis rights, for example, plant variety protection. For our participants that are not intellectual property rights specialists, I have a few samples. Chino Achebe's Things Fall Apart. The literary words in it will be protected by copyright. The photograph on the cover will be also be protected by copyright. We have the single malt whiskey, scotch whiskey, Glen Fiddick. It will be protected by a geographical indication. We have the iPad. The, um, the iPad has a design patent for this design. It, Apple also has a patent for the crack glass for portable devices. And the logo will be protected by a trademark. Um, Bayer's Rivaroxaban, um, a blood thinning medication drug is protected by patent. And this time, another type of apple, this time a pink lady apple, is protected by plant variety protection or plant breeders' rights. The name pink apple is also protected by trademark. The origins of these intellectual property rights can be traced mostly to Europe from the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, copyrights can be tra um, traced to the United Kingdom, patents can be traced to Italy, Geographical indications or appellations of origins can be traced to France. And a 20th century expansion of the intellectual property rights architecture was the introduction of plant variety protection, which can be traced to the United States in the, in the 1900s, so from 1930. The expansion of international trade and globalization led to, this, to the owners of these private rights to want to protect their intellectual property rights in other jurisdictions. And this led to the introduction of international intellectual property rights treaties. The earliest were the in intellectual, the Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property in, 18, in 1883, the Bern Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works in 1886. These were administered by the BIRPI. And which was then, which, which has now been transformed to the World Intellectual Property Organization. Now the WIPO World Intellectual Property Organization administers about 26 treaties. The most recent 
is the Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise disabled. This was adopted on 27th of June 2013, and Dr. Desmond Oriakoba will speak about this. A watershed moment for intellectual property rights was the formal bridge between trade and intellectual property rights with the inclusion of a treaty on intellectual property rights in the Uruguay round of multinational trade negotiations within the framework of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, from 1986 to 1994. This led to the adoption of the Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, or the TRIPS Agreement, as Annex 1C of the Marrakesh Agreement establishing the World Trade Organization. This was signed in Marrakesh, Morocco on 15th April 1994. TRIPS sets global minimum standards of intellectual property rights, covering all of the categories that we mentioned above. And one of the main additions of TRIPS was the introduction of enforcement, strong enforcement through the World Trade Organization's dispute settlement body. However, TRIPS also provides flexibilities. So countries can include these flexibilities in translation of the TRIPS agreement into domestic legal architecture. So for example, Article 7 of TRIPS provides for the protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights to contribute to the promotion of technological innovation and transfer of technology in a manner that is conducive to social and economic welfare. Article 8 provides for WTO members to adopt measures to ensure the protection of public health, which Dr. Makavani would be speaking about. We also have Article 73, which provides for national security exceptions, which Dr. Emmanuel Oke would be talking about. And furthermore, we have substantive exceptions and limitations under different categories of intellectual property rights. So under copyright, for example, we have exceptions to promote access to educational materials. Under patents, we have compulsory licenses to ensure access to essential medicines. And we have the inclusion of the Article 31 Bs as well to ensure importing and parallel importing for least developing and least developed countries. We understand now that the implementation of this TRIPS agreement is framed or informed by political, social, economic, technological realities in the global south. It's also limited by bilateral free trade economic cooperation or agreements. So what we now have at the international level is we have the WIPO administer treaties and we have the WTO set of agreements. We have the TRIPS agreement under the WTO. We can, we, have, we can trace the trajectory of these treaties or the emergence of these international treaties to national laws in Europe and the United States. Um, and this reminds us of Belventura de Sosa Santos's thesis of globalized localism. That is the successful globalization of a particular localism. Our distinguished panelists comprising an excellent mix of established and early career academics and, and professionals will discuss how these global treaties have been implemented at the regional or national levels in the global south. Professor Caroline Unhube and Dr. Desmond Oriakoba will start us off with discussions on copyright. Dr. Emmanuel Oke and Dr. Amaka Vani will discuss pharmaceutical patents, the TRIPS agreement and emerging economies. Dr. Suzanne Isoko Straba and Ms. Jacqueline Wangi will discuss technology, innovation, Africa, and the African continental free trade area. Professor Adibambo Adiwapo and Dr. Uluwato Biloba Moody will present a case study on Nigeria. One of our reasons for choosing the Nigerian case study is WIPO's recent opening of an external office in Nigeria. The WIPO Nigeria office opened in January 2020 is WIPO's second external office in Africa. The first that was opened in Algiers, Algeria was opened in 2019. I will now turn the floor to Caroline to start us off with copyright, the coronavirus disease, COVID-19. Thank you, Titi. Good day, everyone. It is indeed a joy and a privilege to be sitting around this virtual table with my friends, peers, and colleagues. Thank you to Prof. Gatti and the Afronomics Law Team for the leadership and community they're providing. And thank you to everyone who's here today for your engagement and participation. So as you've heard, my brief is to speak about copyright. And I'll base my comments on a blog post I penned in May addressing copyright and emergency remote teaching. 
that post was grounded in the current COVID-19 pandemic context, but it is important to stress that the examination of the appropriateness of IP for developmental contexts is a long-standing academic endeavor, which predates the TRIPS agreement and has continued well beyond its enforcement from 1995. Questions have been raised about how IP saves the public interest in the Global South in relation to the key touch points of access, access to knowledge, access to medicines, access to technologies of all types, and how these questions of access interface with developmental goals, such as the promotion of innovation and binding obligations, such as the protection and promotion of human rights. In relation to copyright, access concerns arise in relation to many aspects, including access for persons with disabilities, educational and research flexibilities, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. For my blog post and these comments, I chose to focus on the educational sector, primarily because that is where my experience, practice, and scholarship collide. I'm an academic teaching in a higher educational institution. My post spoke very specifically to my setting, higher education in South Africa. Today, because we've got such a broad audience and participant um, range, I'm going to speak much more broadly about education in general in the Global South. Disasters and emergencies aggravate inequality. So the current pandemic, as expected, has brought questions of how governments can navigate the intersections of copyright and the right to education to promote, educational, to pr promote access to educational materials for teaching and learning into sharp focus. The socioeconomic right of education, as we know, is protected by the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And I know that many of us are aware that in many of our constitutions that this right has been domesticated. And so each country then has taken upon itself the right to protect and promote the right to education. Once again, I say, of course, because we all know that education and copyright are intertwined. Copyright protects the materials that we need to use for teaching and learning. And indeed, it is safe to say, you cannot realize your right to learning without access to learning materials. And so my colleagues and I, including Susan on this panel, have done a lot of work over a number of years to question how copyright actually affects access to learning materials and by implication, the right to education on the continent. So this extensive re research has shown that there were indeed existing fault lines in the copyright regulatory system. For instance, many laws in the global south focus on face-to-face -face contexts and the exceptions and limitations that you find in copyright laws are actually meant for those contexts, which meant that before the pandemic, online and distance education were vulnerable. And so, as I've said earlier, the pandemic has brought many of these fault lines into sharp focus. And so now that schools and all other kinds of educational institutions have been disrupted, mostly by closures, if you take a look at the UNESCO website, they have a response page there that talks about disruption to education. You will see on that website that at least 60% of the world's school or educational population has been affected by closures and disruptions during the pandemic. What this means then for education is that those copyright questions that we have been asking for a very long time come into sharp focus. So the question then is, with schools and libraries closed currently, or disrupted to a very large extent because of the pandemic, how then are we to access and use teaching and learning materials? One of the answers that has very easily come to, to implementation in many countries is going online because there are difficulties with the transmission of uh, physical materials. Most educational institutions have tried to share their materials online. The problem then with this is in terms of copyright law, it's not always possible. In fact, it is very difficult to then transition to whole scale, extensive, wide ranging digital learning. The answer has come from many perspectives, if you like. Some have argued that you can rely on licensing. My own particular perspective is that licensing does have a place, but it cannot be the primary starting place. My view is that there must be public interest mechanisms that allow us to access teaching and learning materials for online and distance contexts for emergency situations that actually eliminate or obviate our need to rely on licensing mechanisms. And that licensing mechanisms truly should be the icing on the cake. But our governments are obliged to serve us this cake in terms of the human right to education that they have to promote and protect in all contexts. And so in a nutshell, in the five minutes that I'm using to open this conversation, 
they were indeed fault lines in the copyright regulatory framework. These fault lines affected to a large extent those of us in the global south because of our peculiar context and needs for access to learning materials that differ from the rest of the world. The current pandemic has exacerbated these fault lines. And what it means then for our governments is that they do need to go back and look very carefully at what needs to be facilitated or enabled in order to make it possible to leverage or pivot, as they say, to learning and online teaching and learning. And so I think in these five minutes, I'll just put those thoughts on the table. And I hope that after all of my friends, peers and colleagues have spoken, that we can return to some of these questions and dig in a little bit deeper. Thank you, Titi. Thank you very much, Caroline, for that excellent introduction. So we've talked about access to education. We've talked about the fault lines in the copyright regulatory frameworks. We've talked about how the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated these fault lines. Now we'll turn to, the, uh, to Desmond to speak about copyright and access to educational materials for peoples that are visually impaired or otherwise disabled. I want to thank the, the organizers and um, participants and panelists. Um, when we talk about um, issues around access to education, and in particular access to educational materials within the copyright uh, context, there's the possibility, although not consciously, to forget disabled persons in the discussion. In fact, within the um, 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 WIPO um, framework, it was only about 20, 2003 that discussions about, um, you know, the focus, disabled persons came into focus. And we saw how we, it, it is only until 2013 that a treaty was, you know, adopted that uh, caters for, you know, access, uh, caters for persons with disability the Marrakesh um, VIP treaty that is visually impaired, uh, blind and persons um, with uh, within disabilities. Now, as I'm going to point out in my, in my, in the few, next few minutes, I'm going to point out the fact that the Marrakesh treaty, a welcome development in itself, as you know, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic and present realities have, you know, brought to the fore the, the inadequacies of the Marrakesh Treaty because of its focus in terms of persons with disability and the kinds of copyright works it, it tried to create uh, access enablement for persons. But uh, before um, Desmond, I think we're having some technical difficulties. So perhaps, um, to, Desmond, to, to to note that. The work of WIPO in this regard was given in petus, and this human rights consideration started at the leading in 2007 to the adoption of specifically recognizes the rights. I should uh, shut down my. Okay. Thank you, Desmond. Perhaps we would come back to Desmond, and we could move now to. Dr. Emmanuel, okay, so Desmond would come back to talk to us about copyright and the Marrakesh Treaty, but we'll move now to Dr. Emmanuel, okay, and come back to Desmond at the end. Okay, hi everyone, um, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank um, Titi and uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Gassi for the invitation to be part of this uh, important discussion. I'm happy to be here. So today, I, I just want to quickly talk about, in the short time I have, to quickly talk about um, COVID-19 and the national security exception in the TRIPS agreement. Uh, I chose this topic because, I mean, 
uh, in light of the recent pandemic, a number of uh, scholars have suggested that uh, the national security exceptions can be used by countries to perhaps maybe import or produce medicines and vaccines to tackle the pandemic. So I want to look at this particular question in light of the pandemic and in light of, I mean, as the title of the webinar suggests, uh, regional and local realities. Is it, a real, is it a realistic option, so to say? So a brief intro into the national security exception. Um, it's contained in Article 73 of TRIPS, as Titi said in our introduction. And if you look at Article 73 of the TRIPS agreement, uh, the WTO TRIPS agreement, there are a number of exceptions actually that fall under that broad heading security exception. And it mirrors what you find in Article 21 of the GATS. So we had it under the GATS 1947, that's General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade of 1947, which is also part of the GATS 1994, which is part of the WTO agreement. So, but today I want to focus on Article 73B3, right? Article 73BII or triple B. Um, so which permits a state to take any action that it considers necessary for the protection of its essential security interests during the time of war or other emergency in international relations. Now, historically, a number of states have considered this exception to be self-judging and non-justiciable. That, that means they can decide whenever they want to invoke it, and they took the view that it could not be subject to dispute resolution, so you could not challenge it before, say, the WTO panel. So there was this uncertainty surrounding the interpretation of this provision even before the establishment of the WTO and for many years after the establishment of the WTO in 1994. This position has, however, changed you know, recently, particularly last year with the decision in the dispute between Russia and Ukraine, where Russia invoked this exception successfully. And more recently, in the dispute between Saudi Arabia and Qatar involving IP rights, you know, where Saudi Arabia was partially successful in invoking this exception to, to, to defend its actions in respect to the IP rights of a media company based in Qatar. So, uh, so in light of these two recent rulings, you know, the Russia case and the Saudi Arabia case, those two panels identified four factors that, you, that a panel will consider or take into account when deciding whether or not a state can invoke this national security exception. Now, so the first factor is, is uh, the panel will look at whether the existence of a war or other emergency in international relations has been established by the invoking state. Now, this is, a, this is an objective determination, so it's no longer a self-judging thing. You can't just decide for yourself that you have an emergency. You know, it's an objective determination. And they defined, in those two panel reports, they defined an emergency as a situation of armed conflict or of heightened tension or crisis or general instability and golfing or surrounding a state. Now, you could argue that the COVID pandemic arguably fits, you can define this as, 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 as an emergency in a sense, you know, the WHO has said so, it's a, it's a pandemic, you know, and we can see the measures that a number of states have taken to address the, 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 the pandemic. So in a sense, you could call it an emergency, broadly speaking. The second factor is that whatever actions you want to take has to be taken in the time of war or emergency. So any measures that you take now could arguably meet this criteria as well. Too. Now, the third factor is whether the invoking state has articulated its relevant essential security interests, so not just an interest, but essential security interests sufficiently to enable an assessment of whether there's any link between the actions it is taking and the protection of its essential security interests. Now, this is a subjective determination. So it's up to the state to articulate what it considers to be its essential security interest. And I think it's a very easy criteria to satisfy. State, states could easily meet this criteria if they say, well, we need to suspend, say, the enforcement of patent rights so that we can take steps to maintain law and order within our territory. So that's, I think, you could argue that COVID-19 could actually enable a state to do that as well. Too. So the final determination is whether the relevant actions that the state has taken is remote or unrelated to the emergency, so as to make it impossible that those actions are necessary for the protection of the essential security interest during the emergency. Again, this is not a very difficult criteria to meet. And in fact, in both the Russia case and the Saudi Arabia case, 
the states were largely successful in meeting what the panels call the minimum require, requirement of plausibility. So all you have to do is to show that, look, I need to do this thing because I want to protect you know, law and order or I want to protect my state against terrorism or something. So it's not a very difficult criteria to meet. So um, I don't really have so much time to explain all of this. But the, the, the key point I want to say is that, yeah, in theory, on paper, on paper, states could actually satisfy this requirement. They can actually invoke the security exception to defend any actions that they, they take to tackle COVID-19. But taking it back to what I said about the realities on the ground, particularly in African countries or a number of developing countries, I'm not really sure it's actually going to be helpful to countries for a number of reasons. Number one, this exception will only help countries who already have domestic manufacturing capacity. So there's really no point in invoking this exception if you can't produce the drugs locally. Secondly, even with regard to importation, if you want to import, say, patented medicines or vaccines from abroad, you can't really use this exception to circumvent the problems linked with Article 31 Bs of TRIPS, which Titi also referred to in our introduction. So uh, a number of you already know the problems with Article 31 Bs. In fact, it has only been used once by Canada and Rwanda in the context of the HIV AIDS crisis. So it's not really something that countries use a lot. So again, and I say you can't use to circumvent the exception, this problem because the security exception is only for, for your own national problem. So another state cannot invoke it to address a problem in its separate state. You have to invoke it to address your own particular national essential security interest. Then finally, the last one I want to make it, why I think it's not really, it's not really going to be helpful is in um, at least developed countries are in any case already exempt from protecting pharmaceutical patents until 2033. So they don't really need to invoke this exception anyway. So the last, the last one I want to make, I think going forward, I think the focus particularly for African countries and developing countries should really be on developing domestic manufacturing capacity within their territories. And this, I will admit, is a problem that goes beyond IP rights. So thank you very much for listening. I look forward to your questions. And thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. You have raised beautiful points on, on security exceptions under Article 73B, Paragraph 3. You've raised some important cases, Russia, Ukraine, Saudi Arabia, Qatar. You've said some of the factors that the WTO panel would consider when deciding whether security exceptions would be utilized. And you've then said one of the limitations of the application of this exception, which is the manufacturing capacity in global South countries or some emerging economies. Next, we'll turn to Dr. Amakavani, who would also talk about patents in section five, um, articles 27 to 33 of TRIPS and some of the particular circumstances of emerging economies. You could mute, you could unmute your microphone, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thanks, Afronomics, for organizing this webinar. I want to use the six minutes I have to share some thoughts on key issues regarding IP, mostly pharmaceutical patents, access issues, and COVID-19 in emerging economies. So um, the first question is, um, what is the current state of things in emerging economies? Um, most of the countries within these categories um, prior to this pandemic already have problem with poor public health infrastructure and access medicine problem. Um, but these issues and these problems have been exacerbated as a result of the pandemic. So now we have problem of um, or rather problems of not enough testing kits, hospital, bed, hospital beds, uh, ventilators for the critically ill, PPE for health professionals. Um, regarding testing kits, I think within the continent of Africa, South Africa has done the most tests. I think is around 1.5 million tests done so far. Um, in Nigeria, the test, is, the test done so far is not more than 500,000 tests compared to the population of the country. 
we should also remember that in these countries, um, we have high rates of other disease burdens, such as HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, ETC. So if you factor in the problem of COVID, you can see that the situation is very critical. Of course, there is the attendant problem of economic hardship caused by the lockdown that many, many countries put in place. There is also widespread of police violence in places like Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, India. Um, then there's also the issue of absence of financial support, poor plan, um, poor plan urban architecture. So policies like social distancing um, is really difficult to enforce. We must also bear in mind that when we talk about access to medicine, access to medicine issue regarding, with regards to COVID, we are not only talking about treatment, but also vaccines, testing and diagnostic kits, um, PPEs for health professionals. So far, at, um, there are 20, 220 treatments and around 114, 141 vaccines in development or clinical trial stages. Some leading ones include, include remdesivir, which was um, previous, previously used in the treatment of Ebola, but has been repurposed for the treatment of COVID-19. Um, we must also bear in mind that remdesivir hasn't really shown that much therapeutic value in the first place. In fact, a recently um, publicly um, funded studies show that, there is, that the recovery time even reduced from 11 days to, from 15 days to 11 days, but there is no significant reduction in mortality rates. Having said that, the next question then is, with regards to international law, are there international legal instruments in place to deal with COVID? Yes, there are. So we have um, the World Trade Organization um, TRIPS Agreement, which is the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights, like my colleague, um, Professor um, Dr. Oke mentioned. We also have the Doha Declaration that reinforces TRIPS, um, flex the TRIPS agreement, specifically from Article 27 to 31 that talks about flexibilities. Basically, flex TRIP flexibility basically means um, laws and policies countries can implement to take measures to protect public health. So these flexibilities include compulsory licensing, which allows government to use an invention without the consent of patent holders. So you have countries in global south like Ecuador and Chile and Costa Rica that have already put policies in place to um, facilitate an easy uh, application of compulsory license in the events we find the treatment and vaccine for COVID. Other countries such as South Africa, Brazil, India, and even Nigeria, they all, we all have, they all have policies in place to do with um, compulsory licensing. Even in these countries that ongoing discussions with regard to patent reforms and um, to ensure that everyone has equal access to diagnostics, treatments, and vaccines when they become available. But we must also remember that even with compulsory license in place, vaccines might, it might be difficult to invoke that when it comes to vaccines, mainly because there are very few manufacturers and these manufacturers operate in very few countries dealing with vaccines. There is no generic competition when it comes to vaccines and you need a generic producer to upscale and mass produce medicine to be able to export it to the countries that have invoked the compulsory license. You also have parallel importation, which allows officials to import and resell patented drugs from another country where they may have been on sale for a cheaper price. So far since this pandemic has started, other solutions have emerged. Um, we have voluntary licensing, which is where uh, innovator drug company licenses a pharmaceutical technology to generate manufacturers to produce uh, the innovator drug uh, at a very cheap rate. So I think last month or two months ago, Gilead Pharmaceuticals signed voluntary licensing agreements with nine companies to supply remdesivir to 127 countries. 
these nine companies are in India. However, two issues stand out with regards to this particular um, voluntary license. First, uh, it is not transparent, so we don't, or the civil society and academics and professionals don't have access to this um, agreement, so there is no transparency for us to understand the terms and conditions for this voluntary license. Um, so a lot of people feel that it is a way for uh, Gilead to control global supply of remdesivir. We also, also, should also remember, we, um, another factor is that a lot of um, key emerging countries like Brazil, Argentina, Ecuador, Russia, Peru are all excluded from this voluntary license. And these countries, particularly Brazil, have high rates or high incidence of COVID cases. This, mean, this means that these countries won't have access to cheaper generic versions. They will have to buy the costlier branded version from Gilead. Then you have um, uh, voluntary pooling, which is where uh, companies, research laboratories, universities collect um, openly, like submit the pharmaceutical technology, their research and data for development of vaccines and treatments. So right now we have the World Health Organization COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, known as the CTAP. So this is that this is that aim to compile and share COVID-19 health technology and related knowledge, intellectual property and data. Then you have the Gavi Alliance uh, Advanced Market Commitments, which basically means that um, Gavi intends to pool resources and share uh, vaccine development risk. So in this particular case, Gavi hopes to uh, source for funds, I think the amount is uh, $14 billion to buy up the vaccines, uh, COVID vaccines when it becomes available and then at, at the market price or at the price set by the manufacturers and then provide these vaccines to countries, poor countries or lower income countries that can't afford the original market price. Even with the Gavi 19 COVID, COVID, COVAX facility, um, two issues also stand out, which is how would the facility be governed? And also there is the issue of transparency and accountability in governance, if you considering the billions of dollars involved. That said, there are also other issues emerging with regards to access and pharmaceutical challenge because of COVID. This include um, drug nationalism. This is where countries are in exclusive agreements with pharmaceutical companies to develop and mass produce treatments and vaccines for their population. So for instance, beginning of this month or last month, I think, the United States Department of Health and Human Services announced that the US has signed agreement with Gillet to ensure that nearly all the um, supply of remdesivir for the next three months, the US has bought it up. Um, but it's not surprising because um, when the uh, swine flu, when we had the incidence of swine flu, uh, developed countries also bought up and stockpile uh, the, 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 med, the, the treatment for that as well. Even beginning of this year, when it was announced that uh, a steroid medicine, I think it's called Dexamethasin um, can be used in the treatment of COVID. The United, the United Kingdom placed it on their export ban list, meaning that uh, manufacturers cannot export it without um, losing their, um, and cannot export it. And if they decide to export it, they will lose their license. Also, earlier in the year when hydroxy and chloroquine was first announced as one of the contenders for treatments, India being one of the largest manufacturers of hydroxychloroquine briefly put it on its, briefly banned its exports. So basically drug nationalism, we've been, we can see that um, cropping up a lot more because countries are trying to protect the interests of their citizens. Then as Emmanuel also mentioned, there is the problem of lack of manufacturing capacity to produce drugs. So even if there is new treatment or vaccines are developed, there is limited manufacturing capacity, especially within emerging economies, developing countries to ensure massive and rapid scaling up of products. 
Um, in addition to this, they now have the problem um, other issues of other barriers to access, such as data exclusivity, market exclusivity. So data exclusivity is, um, is when generic, um, generic manufacturers are not allowed to use the clinical trial data uh, um, gathered by innovative drug companies to get approval for follow-on products. So this can um, hamper access because they don't, even though their demo drugs show efficacy and uh, the same quality as the innovative brand drug, because they don't have uh, clinical drug and um, the clinical trial doctor, they have to go and conduct their own um, clinical trials, which can be costly. This delays the coming into market of generic medicines. So to conclude, going forward, what next? Um, for me, I think when this whole pandemic is over, when we have COVID under control, in addition to um, insisting that countries implement and be quick to use TRIPS flexibility, we should also encourage discussion on um, technology transfer. I mean, if you read the TRIPS agreements, one of the objectives of the agreement is technology transfer. And so far, countries have not lived up to that you know so when this is over the next set of discussion is how can we transfer technology from uh pharmaceutical superior countries to emerging economies and developing countries not only technology transfer but also develop manufacturing capacity because it's all well and good if you can get the pharmaceutical kind of technology but do you have the local infrastructure and the local uh capacity to manufacture these drugs. I think even within Africa, it's very, very, very few countries like South Africa and Egypt. Um, I think Tanzania and Kenya can also can manufacture pharmaceuticals locally. Nigeria, based on my field work I did a couple of days ago during my PhD research, struggles with pharmaceutical manufacturing. Um, also, we need to amend laws to prevent, um, to remove other forms of barriers so things like data exclusivity, market exclusivity, even though these are not explicit in TRIPS agreements, uh, bilateral agreements between countries. So like, for instance, the US uh, agreements with certain developing countries um, tend to have uh, these TRIP plus measures. So this uh, data and market exclusivities that prevent um, drugs to come into markets um, when they are off patent. So going forward, these are the things we need to discuss, you know, investments in public health infrastructure, including private and public hospitals, encourage technology transfer, as well as um, develop local manufacturing capacity, and then amend laws to ensure that, to ensure quick and easy access to medicines and also remove other forms of um, monopolies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amaka. That was an excellent um, presentation on on pharmaceutical patents, access to medicines, emerging emerging economies, developing countries, least developed countries. We've talked about compulsory licensing. You said how different countries have been able to apply or even revise their laws on compulsory licenses using examples from Ecuador, Chile, Costa Rica, um, within Africa, South Africa, India, Brazil, Nigeria. You've said the You've said that while we might have the provisions and compulsory licensing in Article 31 and 31Bs, one of the limitations of the implementation of th that provision will be the domestic manufacturing capacity. You've also said that beyond intellectual property rights or paid pharmaceutical patents, we could look at other types of frameworks to ensure access to medicines and other types of um, diagnostics and relevant pharmaceutical products for COVID-19, including voluntary licenses, voluntary pooling, um, alliances, and I would add WHO's um, solidarity framework as well. You've talked about some of the drugs that are being tested, um, and you've talked about using the TRIPS flexibility effectively. So let us go back to Article 7 and think about technology transfer. Let's think about how we would ensure that Global South countries are developing their own manufacturing capacity to be 
capacity to be able to develop these generic these generic medicines and beyond that let's think about how we can have open voluntary licenses so that we would understand what the terms of these licenses are and to develop the generic manufacturing capacity in the global south so thank you very much for that and next we'll go to a related subject but this time we're going to focus more on innovation technology africa the african continental free trade area and we'll start with susan susan the floor is yours I think you're on mute now, please. You are right. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Chichi and uh, Afronomics for inviting me and for setting up this platform. Uh, yeah, as my, as Chichi has mentioned, I'll talk about many things. Technology, innovation, solidarity, and the African continent of free trade area or agreement. And I thought this was a moment for us to think about what do we learn from COVID-19 situation for the current or ongoing or forthcoming negotiations of the AFCTA. The second phase of the African Content of Free Trade Agreement or AFCTA will focus on uh, intellectual property, investment, and uh, competition and maybe e-commerce. So it, it got me thinking, what do we have in the basket? From Chichi's introduction and all the presentations have hammered the point that most of the intellectual property regimes we have, not most, actually basically all, they are foreign to Africa and they are protected intellectual property is protected. So we have to get, use it under exceptions, which uh, AMAC has just demonstrated. They have a lot of limitations. We may not be able to use it in practice. And we don't have the means to, to pay for it because that's the alternative to exceptions that we pay for it because it's someone's property anyway. So I was looking and I, I took my, my presentation is based on conversations with people on the continent, especially regional economic communities, which I, I thought I would inquire and probe and find out how are they managing and what is their vision and what is the way forward. Because I think that the FCTA will need to take some lessons from the regional communities. But that, so the question I had in mind, what have we learned from uh, COVID-19 or how are the regional communities managing COVID-19 that could be of lessons, positive or negative, for the FCCA, FCCA nego negotiations. And just uh, to draw uh, a few minutes back and uh, I'll talk slightly about the Solidarity platform or Solidarity call. I will be very brief because I think David will give it a, a better treatment. But what I wanted to highlight is the relationship with African countries, like uh, many African countries that do not have the technology really. This is, it's a technology call as it has been uh, explained. And one of the things it causes the sharing of technology including intellectual property, including data, globally. It's like one gets it and one shares or what shares information. And I want to particularly stress the reaction of the pharmaceutical companies to this particular kind of call. The call, the strategy call was launched on 25th, on 29th May and Shortly before that, the pharmaceutical companies had had a meeting and one of them, one of the top leaders called this a nonsense to think that there will be voluntary licensing of intellectual property to, because it's uh, what the WHO or what we think and believe is a pandemic, the COVID-19. And what came along as a question to me, Okay, there are maybe flexibilities. Okay, maybe there are exceptions at the international level. But what happens if the owner of the technology doesn't want to share? Yes, we might agree that we need to share, but we can't force 
different constituents to share. For magical companies, just an example here I've, I've picked up, the EU has gone along to, to do its own thing and to focus on its own uh, member states. Understandably, we've just had the example of Gilead and the USA and the UK, understandably. So the question I raised in one of my posts, there's a post I, I, I put up on, the, on Afronomics on the 16th of June, it was actually specifically in preparation for this, is Africa able to come up with technological solutions to Africa's healthy problems? That's one. Two, how could this be or what can be gathered or gleaned from what is already happening on the continent? Because I raise this because from the conversations, it's like there's been an acceptance that all solutions for Africa or all solutions for developing countries have to come from what the developed country have decided. And what has been decided, we can only use intellectual property as a way of exceptions or flexibilities. But this is a situation where, okay, you, we can't even use voluntary licensing, we cannot use compulsory licensing, as Amak has just said, there's no innovation, we, we don't have the capacity. But then it does, doesn't mean we are that doomed, according to my research and conversations. I was having, enjoying my conversations with people since yesterday and today from the, from the continent. I remember, and, and well, some years ago, I was listening to my mentor, Professor Ruth Okediji, and she, she raised a question, she had raised a question in one article, whether Africa, whether creativity has died in Africa. Do, does Africa create? And I'm raising a question now, does Africa innovate? And especially in this moment, can we? And if yes or no, what are the implications for the FCTA? I focus on FCTA because it's going to be a continental framework. We want trade, there's an aspiration for trade on the African continent. You cannot detach intellectual property and technology from trade. So it needs to be fixed or we need to understand where we stand. That's how I raise it. I don't think innovation has died in Africa. Just it may not be defined or understood, the West defined, understood in the West. And I give a two examples, which I also take as indicators of what could be considered as input for the FCTA document or instrument. Just this morning, I was talking to one of the regional communities, and uh, they, we, we just, during the conversation, I learned that actually regional communities, okay, the East African community, I'm sorry I had to, re, to research on that, that's because that's where I come from, charity starts at home. So the, what, there have been work to concretize access to pharmaceuticals, much as the, EST, uh, the ESC members, the six member states are parties to the international agreements. And before even the conversation on intellectual properties or pharmaceutical starts in the FCTC, it has already started on the, on the, on the regional level. There is a conversation and there, are, there is collaboration with the African Union, there is collaboration with COMESA and SADAC because there is a tripartite agreement. So it's the dynamics there. Already there is that thinking. So what needs to be done is really guiding what goes into that document. Is there creativity? There is this one example I'll give. You have the CENIC, the Center for, I forget the full name. Anyway, it, it's, it's a, a, a center of excellence in East Africa. You have students who come up with innovation of different kinds under open access. And the condition of the innovation is that it has to be useful to the regional community, to the East African community. So there are those two com uh, conditions already. And there was this particular situation that just hit me. The students came up with a, a, a program that helps detect drowsiness or a drowsiness detector 
like and these are students and said okay we need to put it where it to be used, used the most most useful and it was put to a bus it was proposed to a bus company kira bus company kira has come up with an e-bus do you see that we see how the technology is coming up and that that whole process and that project is being supported by the Ugandan government. So you have the centers of excellence, you have the industry and the government, policymakers, researchers, and industry coming together. Not just the industry like we would have it at the West, or we have it in our minds. And when, think, when we are thinking about protection or with, uh, with about rules in the CFCTA, one of the things I challenged in my short write-up that we need to come up with local solutions to our challenges. And what are our regional realities? We don't have access to as much innovation, as much money as others, but they are brains too. And the rules need to be adjusted and not just big roughly. One of the things I question that instead of harmonizing international standards, we should actually think of coming up with our own rules. There's no law against that. There will be, at, if, if any country comes with trade sanctions, it won't be because there's a violation to be something else. And that brings me to the second point. The need for using the, the negotiations of the FCTA as a bargaining chip with trading partners in the West as to what should be the conditions and what, should, what is necessary and useful technology for the continent. The last point, because I'm running out, we, we might we'll come back to this if necessary, is, uh, is, is the encouragement of uh, creativity or innovation of what we have in what particular facility, but it can be put to other purposes. What we see now and understand, we, so there's a lot of effort that is going into finding vaccines and solutions to the COVID-19. What will happen when we do not, we are not handling that anymore? Or oh, that's not what we are addressing. We have other health challenges. And this I, I again come uh, got a, a real example. When people are thinking of this kind of technologies, on African continent, they really need to be open as opposed to proprietary or closed. So this technology, yes, this kind of technologies are not so much encouraged in the West, but you're saying this is made in Africa and we do it our way, the way it works. So how, what do I mean? Let's take again the example of COVID. Okay, we stop to, the, to come up with COVID material or protection of vaccine. And I want to emphasize that why I take it out because the first COVID ventilator was actually created through this kind of mechanism that now it's not needed, so we got another one. So when it's not needed, then we might have to think to expand hepatitis C, production of hepatitis C vaccine like uh, parity chemicals in Uganda is doing or other vaccines or other medicines. But for that to happen, the technology has to be open. Then you, the question might be then how do you encourage young, young uh, entrepreneurs who are spending sleepless nights coming up with solutions. That's when the government needs to come in and uh, remunerate those people they get some kind of recompense until such a time when we've developed our technology that then we can protect everything and pay it up. Thank you. i stop here for now. Thank you very much, Susan, for those excellent thoughts. So now we are going back to the conceptualization of intellectual property. What, what are the justifications for intellectual property? Is it an incentive to innovate? Do, do governments have to rethink what types of incentive we need to develop to ensure that we're designing and introducing technologies that will be fit for purpose for Africa? The other question would be, what types of technologies are we referring to? We'll be looking at the home front, at national levels, at regional levels, 
for the types of technologies that we can develop within Africa. And I think that's an excellent way in to link to the discussion that Jackie would be presenting. The other point you raised were the developments that we have at the regional economic community. So what is happening, for example, in East African regional economic community, and how can we harness these divergent developments that we have around technological innovations within the different fragments of economic communities we have in Africa to provide a holistic technological framework that will be beneficial to the whole of Africa. One platform that you have suggested would, could be a way forward would be the African continental free trade area. So going back to intellectual property rights within the African continental free trade area, which will be negotiated in phase two, and to think about how we can then design effective systems that will be fit for purpose for Africa. Africa. So thank you very much, Susan. Now we will come back to those questions in the Q&A session. Now I'll, I'm pleased to turn the floor to Jackie, who is going to give us a brilliant presentation on social innovation, which I find really fascinating. The floor is yours, Jackie. Um, thank you so much, TT, James, and the Afronomic Slow team for the opportunity to participate in this webinar and to just be amongst my seniors and contributing to knowledge in Africa. It's a pleasure. So um, Susan raised quite you know, important questions. Does Africa innovate? Can we innovate? Has innovation in Africa died? And I, I mean, my response to this is of course not. And um, I'd like to just say that minds at the margin are not marginal minds. So uh, my remarks uh, will focus on IP law and the realities of innovation in African countries. Um, and a disclaimer is that I will speak more innovation and less law, but that should not be a problem because we have already heard plenty about the interplay between intellectual property law and public interest needs such as education, access to medicines and technology sharing, and especially the ways in which Africa is politically disadvantaged in global rules and policies. Um, so far, the story has been quite depressing, just to, to, to know, to just sit, listen to how um, global rules are enacted and provide flexibilities that African countries cannot take advantage of. Um, it's it's a sad and depressing story. And I hope that with this presentation, I can um, equally be um, critical, but also provide a positive story as to what, um, you know, what is happening in African countries and just the you know, beautiful stories of innovation that are taking place every single day. Um, so speaking of local realities, one crucial component is the concept of frugal innovation or as I like to call it, social innovation. And the reason for this characterization will be clear later on in this presentation. So what do these realities look like? Four years ago, an innovator in Uganda developed a low cost food dehydrator that can increase the shelf life of fruits and vegetables from two days to two years, serving as a great alternative to the extremely efficient but unaffordable electric dehydrators or refrigerators, if you may. So notably, this food dehydrator is powered by garden waste and discarded paper and has been sold to numerous rural farmers across East Africa who have reported a shortage in food waste and supplementary income from selling dried fruits and vegetables. Similar story four years later, Africa is hit by the COVID-19 pandemic and um, commentators all over predict that Africa will be hardest hit because they you know they have no means to contain the spread of the virus. If it's masks, we can't produce our own masks. We don't have enough testing kits, etc. But um, numerous odd balls across Africa have developed low cost innovations such as hand washing machines, ventilators, respirators, testing kits. And same as the food dehydrator, these innovations are produced from locally sourced materials, including wood and tankers um, in the case of hand washing machines. So why am I sharing these stories? It's because I would like to invite us to, invite us to think about innovation as an ideology and as a legal construct. 
to begin with, uh, innovation has always been a buzzword. Society, including policymakers, suffers from what sociologist Everett Rogers termed a pro-innovation bias. And this is just, it's a belief that innovation is good, it's desirable for society, everybody should innovate. If you're innovating, props to you, let's encourage more innovation. <laughs> so we never really question what this term innovation means, neither do we ask about the consequences of innovation. And um, in African countries, this is, you know, it's even worse because technological comprehension is underguarded by um, economic orthodoxies about how innovation takes place and the role of innovation and intellectual property in that process. So if we are to think about what is desirable innovation based on what I just described, it would be innovation that leads to economic growth, one. Secondly, it would be innovation that um, culminates in the issuance of a patent or another you know, intellectual property right, but for my case, I limit it to patents. Thirdly, it could be an innovation that uh, has the capacity to achieve scale. So in essence, we are talking of a, of a concept of innovation that is wedded into an economic ideology so much that we forget that innovation is also political. And, um, you know, one may wonder, you know, the audience may wonder, what does it mean to say that innovation is political? And one asked, you know, what a response to that would be um, an aspect of its politics is the unintended consequences of innovative activities. And um, this means that the benefits of innovation are by no means equally divided, both globally and locally. So, there are instances in which the process of technological development is biased towards a particular direction, such that it produces results that are counted as wonderful breakthroughs by some and results in setbacks to others, you know? So it's, we may celebrate innovation as, you know, encouraging productivity, but it also comes at a sacrifice to others. And, um, you know, IP law is implicated in this at the point of granting a property right because it's a process that is, you know, perceived as value neutral. We never think about the consequences of patented innovations. You know, yeah. So just to link this to the dehydrator that I just mentioned, when the electrical dehydrator was developed, it resulted in a patent and definitely improved productivity and welfare for all who could afford it. But you know, the inventor and similar suppliers in Uganda, for instance, had certain consumers in mind, definitely not rural farmers who instead chose sun drying as an alternative until the food dehydrator powered by garden waste was innovated. So this brings me to the new buzzword, which is social innovations. And the proper way to understand social innovations, especially for, uh, for our perspective as African countries and you know, African people who were once perceived as people who had no capacity to invent, um, they are innovations that shift power. And this means that they give the poor and the powerless more control over their own lives and the advanced social justice. So the food dehydrator and the COVID-19 innovations are excellent examples of social innovations that are on the rise in many African countries. And their existence may help us to gain a better understanding of law and innovation in our societies. So I'll just summarize this discussion because I, have, I had six minutes and I decided to keep time. Um, I will summarize this discussion with three implications for how we should think about law and innovation you know, in a post-COVID-19 world. Um, yeah. So first is that social innovations are sometimes innovations that occur beyond the patent paradigm, meaning that they are localized versions of existing inventions and may not necessarily be new in the patent sense. So um, African countries have been historically excluded from the benefits of innovation through global intellectual property rules. And therefore, this should sound as a warning to policy makers that they should be cautious about 
erecting the same barriers that have you know nationally by overemphasizing false ideologies on the necessity of intellectual property rights to prevent coping of ideas or the necessity of intellectual property rights for successful business and i'm glad that there are lawyers in the audience because they're the you know primary drivers of this false ideology so i think we need to rethink our own um ideologies as well so it's not very useful to think of intellectual property in this sense because it's not useful for justice and freedom neither is it useful from an economic sense and the reason for this is because intellectual property law protects both inventions and creatively copied innovations through a very under researched property right called the utility model which you know we should probably study more and find ways in which to encourage innovation through the utility model so equally it is not useful make point of view because there have been numerous studies that have shown that the grant of a patent right does not always result in increased sales and in fact a vast majority of patents are worthless so um secondly uh, it's important to emphasize that there are other means of attaining technology transfer that do not particularly rely on formal reform of intellectual property law or international intellectual property law um there are alternative routes through which global um commons based production networks have contributed to innovation in african countries and could contribute further to fostering technological capacity and development in this context and the example of the ugandan ventilator that has been developed through uh, from mit open source designs certainly shows that this is not a far fetched possibility at all it is an invitation for all of us to look beyond the you know intellect international intellectual property law framework and its politics and look for alternative ways of seeking the same um goals of you know in increasing technology transfer improving development prospects prospects for our people. to dwell on the politics and um know the, the the barriers that have been created by um trips not this is not to say that we should not keep you know advocating for more equal rules so lastly but not least recognizing social innovation requires questioning the frameworks that deliberately obscure the existence their existence and their relevance so this means rethinking um the economic ideology of you know and the systems that entrench it so it's you know the rationality of technology policy that promotes only innovation in formal institutions needs to change covid-19 innovations should offer new beginnings to learn about the philosophy of frugal innovations and how they may be uh, incorporated in formal in national innovation systems frameworks in a manner that encourages the sharing of ideas between formal and informal systems and just to conclude it's just an emphasis on the point that minds at the margin are not marginal minds thank you excellent thank you so much jackie so lots of food for thought low cost innovation how do we include low cost innovation in africa in the international intellectual property rights architecture that we have should we be thinking about social justice and innovation that has social impact so when we're thinking about technology development technology transfer we should be thinking about the types of technology that have that are useful that have social impact or that are that are culturally suitable to the context that we have in africa and then thinking about both the intellectual property and i was a bit confused there perhaps we could go back into that during the q and a proprietary rights are we thinking about promoting proprietary rights and then designing frameworks within proprietary rights or intellectual property rights that would be beneficial to social innovation or are we thinking of other types of protection systems that we should be developing to or crafting to suit the african context so we'll go back to that during the q and a thank you very much for your excellent presentation next we'll go to desmond to talk to us about copyright and the marrakesh treaty 
apologies for the ECOPS earlier. Um, I guess my um, network is conspiring against uh, my participation in this uh, very important uh, event. Okay, so back to what I was saying. In the discussion about access to educational materials, there's the possibility to, you know, neglect this, you know, very substantial mass of the global population, uh, you know, represented by persons with disability. Uh, as we all know, I mean, it's public knowledge that the, the persons with disability make up 15% of the global population, and 80% uh, of that is drawn from developing countries, with Africa having between 60 to um, 18 million persons living with different forms of uh, disability. So this brings to fore the importance of, you know, approaching issues of, I mean, of not neglecting dis dis uh, persons with disability when we talk about access to educational materials, and especially within the context of re the right to education. Um, there is already international uh, uh, treaty, uh, you know, that ensures the uh, United Nations Convention on the Rights of uh, Persons with Disability, that ensures that educational policies, educational strategies, and actions by governments at national levels, uh, you know, in with relations to persons with disability, are geared towards ensuring inclusiveness. In other words, geared uh, towards ensuring that persons with disabilities are not neglected when, you know, educational policies are, are, are being, uh, you know, uh, implemented. In fact, what this, the CROPD has done, the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, is to bring, is to, you know, uh, establish the human rights approach in that regard. In Africa, just in 2018, uh, a somewhat similar um, 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 treaty, if you like, the protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the protection of um, persons with disability, on the rights of persons with disability, was adopted but that, as of today, that um, uh, protocol is still not, uh, it's not enforced because it has not even been ratified or acceded to by any, uh, 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 so this is just like an aside. But within the context of IP, I mean, and the framework of the World IP Organization, the Marrakesh Treaty, you know, was adopted and it's already now enforced, as we know, and has been so far been ratified or acceded by, you know, over um, 60 um, member states of the WIPO. Marrakesh Treaty was given vent or was given impetus to by mainly also by the um, Convention on um, uh, the, um, the CROPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. But the question within this discussion will be uh, wh why is the Marrakesh Treaty important? Secondly, what does it cover? What, what does it not cover? And uh, that leads to the last question, which will be what is the work, the work of the the WIPO Standing Committee on uh, uh, Copyright and Related Rights relating to, you know, formulating uh, limitations and exceptions for persons with disability. Now, for the benefit of those who are not um, um, IP, um, uh, who are me, sorry to use the word, who I may refer to as IP layman, uh, it is important to note that the, the Marrakesh Treaty is the first treaty that sort of established Established the user right. You know, it was it was established user right within the within within the work. I mean, within IP discourse. Uh, it, this is because it uh, record it creates certain exceptions in IP works. I mean, copyright works for persons with disability. And what are this? What, what what does the Marrakesh Treaty cover essentially? Now, the Marrakesh Treaty defines its beneficiaries as you know persons with visual impairment, persons who are blind or who are otherwise uh, 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 print uh, disabled. The definition of his beneficiaries can also be extended to persons with physical disabilities and sensory disabilities, okay? But it, in terms of copyright works, it covers print works, uh, works, uh, you know, uh, uh, protected by the Bank Convention now, literary works and uh, artistic works. Now, this coverage of the Marrakesh Treaty also reflects its limitation. Limitation in the sense that copyright works goes beyond just print works. We have sound recordings, we have um, uh, uh, audiovisual works, for instance, which are not within the context of, uh, of, 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 of the Marrakesh Treaty. And the implication of this is that 
accessible format for persons uh, uh, for, for persons with visual impairments, blind or otherwise uh, 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 print disabled cannot be made on um, 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 access, uh, uh, cannot ordinarily be made on, uh, um, to, for them to access audiovisual works or, uh, as I said, um, sound recording. Again, persons with multiple disabilities, that is maybe a combination of visual impairment or oral you know, uh, disability, cannot, do, not, do not fall under the, the, the cover of the Marrakesh VIP treaty. Persons with oral disability, those who are there for hard of hearing, are also not covered you know, by the Marrakesh Treaty. Okay, so as important, as important as the Marrakesh Treaty is, it has limitations. It is these limitations that have now within the context of, of, of WIPO, you know, uh, that have given, that have gave rise to the ongoing work of the um, um, WIPO Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights. And um, to, to inform their discussion, studies, you know, a study was, a scoping study was recently done by a team led by Professor Caroline Okube and uh, Professor Blake, uh, Ray Blake of the University of Colorado. And I was fortunate to, or privileged to be part of that team. Uh, that study informed a recent paper that was uh, authored, you know, led by Professor Caroline, Professor Blake, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, by, by chance of luck, my humble self. What that study, and of course, as published in the paper recently in World in Journal of World IP, has done is to um, we 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 the paper mapped out or scoped out the, the trend in the protection or the access enabling provisions in the copyright works of all 192 WIPO um, uh, member states. Okay. 192 WIPO member states. And we, 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 the paper, in that paper, we, in that uh, study, we found that out of that 192, 101 do not have access enabling provisions in their copyright, uh, national copyright laws. Okay? 91 have. Okay? And of that 91, you know, uh, uh, 23 are, you know, uh, um, um, 23 are countries that have ratified or acceded to the Marrakesh Treaty. So it means that the makeup of countries that have access enabling provisions for persons with disability goes beyond, you know, um, countries, um, goes beyond countries that have ratified the Marrakesh Treaty. Now, the whole conversation of the um, uh, SCCR at the moment is actually whether to craft, you know, it centers around the question of whether to craft international normative framework modeled after the Marrakesh Treaty, but that caters for persons with disability beyond just print, beyond just visual, uh, visual impairment, beyond blind persons, and beyond those who are otherwise print disabled, to include persons who have oral disability, persons who have, uh, you know, a multiple disability, cognitive and you know, intellectual disability. That is the major con conversation going on currently at the WIPO SCCRO. And then that leads to another question of, if there should be such uh, 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 international normative framework, should it take the form of a binding international treaty or should it take the form of a soft law? And these are some of the uh, you know, issues that are, are, are the, the paper we published at the Journal of International I, uh, I, uh, you know, of what IP considered, but in considering that, we also looked at, we tried to, we looked at the definition of, you know, dis disabled persons, which, you know, became, it became very, uh, it became apparent that the approach taken by the Marrakesh Treaty falls short of the definition of disabled persons by the World Health Organization, and even the definition of disabled persons under um, the 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 the, the um, uh, convention on the rights of persons with disability, but one important question would then be: for developing countries, is it, is it just enough to you know have the laws to that that's you know to have? Is it just enough to include in their in their copyright regimes a framework that enables access to copyright works by persons with disability, modeled after the VIP, uh, the Marrakesh VIP Treaty, or that goes beyond it? I think, in answering that question, that it is not just enough to have such, arrangement, uh, such, such um, 
um, um, legal framework. There is an additional action that is required, and that will be investment into because investment into making accessible copies of you know um, the Marrakesh Treaty and making them available to as many, if not all, if at all persons with disability within their national jurisdictions. This is actually a very tall order because getting accessible copies of copyright protected, protected works of persons with disability is not only labor intensive, but also very you know, uh, uh, cost uh, you know, intensive. Yes, the, with the development of artificial intelligence you know, in present time, it is possible to, it is possible, e easier to have this, uh, to have copyright protected works modified or remediated within, you know, uh, uh, available legal framework. But again, for us at the developing, uh, at, 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 in the global south, I mean the developing countries now, do we have the capacity, both mat material and even uh, financial resources to, you know, engage? or you know, um, um, produce and distribute access in uh, 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 invest in artificial intelligence that will make it possible for us or easier for us to develop access, uh, accessible format for copyright works you know, for the education of persons with uh, uh, a disability. That's, I know that's one question that I think we probably may engage with in the, in the course of this. Um, but um, the, 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 my, my final thoughts, that I will live with. We, in our paper, we have argued that it is better to uh, have a binding treaty, modeled after the Marrakesh treaty, VIP treaty, but that goes beyond the Marrakesh VIP treaty that provides limitations and exceptions for persons with disability beyond that which is covered by, instead of leaving it, instead of having a soft law, which as we all know in international law, is not as uh, you know binding, the, the, the binding effect is, 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 is not, uh, cannot be compared to, you know, a binding treaty. I will leave that as my final thoughts. I will leave that those questions for, you know, participants to to engage with. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Desmond, for this excellent thoughts. You have shared with us the reasons why the Marrakesh Treaty is important, particularly in Africa, because of the percentage of the uh, of the peoples that that live with disability. So we have to ensure that intellectual property rights frameworks, copyright in this instance, would cater to all members of society. And um, Caroline has nicely started us off with that, with fault lines on, cop on the copyright regulatory framework. So now we are going to turn to um, Adebambo to give us a case study on Nigeria. So what are the actual realities and intellectual property rights in, in Nigeria? What are the developments that we have at the moment? Um, the floor is yours, Professor Adewapo. Thank you, TJ. Thank you. Let me join. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Uh, let me join quickly. Join my colleagues to um, to express my personal appreciation to Economics and uh, Dr. Adebola and Mr. James uh, Cathy for inviting me for having me in this very very um, important um, conversation around IP and uh, the issues. In, in discussing uh, IP developments in Nigeria, I, I will just briefly um, look at it from three perspectives. Um, I look at where we are today, the historical background to where we are and uh, where we are to, today, give a very brief overview of, of the present state of IP regime or regimes as the case may be. And uh, lastly, um, give one or two very important narratives in the current development in IP uh, landscape uh, as it stands today. Um, so, of course, the, uh, we have over a century old IP, history of IP in Nigeria, beginning from the introduction of received English law uh, in the early uh, 20th century, uh, starting with the trademark proclamation of 1900. You have the patent ordinance of the same year and the copyright ordinance of 1912. Um, apart from case law, uh, over a period of about two, three, four decades, um, major legislative developments did not take place until after the independence in 1960. Uh, we had the Trademark Act of 1965, uh, Copyright and Patents Act uh, of 1970, respectively. Uh, since that era, 
uh, copyright has, has, the, has been the only area of IP that has received the legislative attention with the Copyright Act of 1988, uh, which repealed and replaced the 1970 Act. Uh, in addition, uh, we have the two amendments to that Act, 1992 amendments and 1999 amendments. So today, um, today IP law in, in Nigeria stands on a tripod of the Trademarks Act, um, Trademarks Act of 1965, Copyright Act of 1988 as amended, and the Patent um, Act of 1970. Let me just quickly uh, give us some of the essential features uh, or milestones, as it were, of this uh, IP, IP legislation. In the copyright area, for instance, we've had an expanded scope of eligible copyright works, uh, six of them plus uh, neighboring rights. Um, and of course, to support those rights are uh, a bundle of exclusive rights, basically, as we all know. And there's also the framework of limitations and exceptions uh, in the area of uh, both patent and, uh, and copyright, compulsory licenses and patent, and of course, copyright. Uh, Copyright Act as well to address the question of access uh, in patents to, to essential medicine, for instance, and in the copyright field to educational materials for teaching and learning. And of course, uh, the issue of fair dealing as well. Now, also for the first time in the history of copyright uh, law in Nigeria, we have a framework for collective management uh, under the 1992 amendment. And also for the first time, uh, in the history of copyright, we have uh, the establishment or introduction of the Copyright Regulatory Agency that we know today as the, as the Nigerian Copyright uh, Commission. 30 years old now, uh, an agency responsible for administration and enforcement of uh, copyright. Of course, the trademark registry, the patent registry still stands as the uh, agency for maintaining, for registering, maintaining and ETC of patent and um, uh, trademarks in Nigeria. Both the trademark and patent laws have not gone beyond the rudimentary standard of protection, uh, for instance, of distinctive trademarks, patentable inventions in the commercial, industrial, and technological environment. Now, having said that, I, I want to quickly um, uh, point out or highlight some noticeable what I would call noticeable challenges to IP development over the years uh, in the Nigerian um, environment. The first one is IP jurisprudence has not developed very much uh, over the years. And this may be due to a lot of factors, for instance, a lack of uh, expertise, uh, not just uh, uh, in, in terms of the, 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 the mass of, um, of, of knowledge or, or uh, personnel in IP, but also in terms of uh, the judges or the courts. So the body of case law has been very scanty and largely unhelpful. The second point that uh, I will make is the, uh, is the fact that uh, there is an inadequacy of existing IP framework uh, across the three areas. Uh, this is closely related to the lack of um, IP jurisprudence that I mentioned the inadequacy of the existing law it's, uh, is very apparent uh, in, the, in the IP laws in all the three areas. Uh, for example, in copyright, there is lack, very, very clear lack of copyright protection in the digital environment, an aspect which, you know, as far back as the 90s uh, has been the subject of successive um, legislative reform in many jurisdictions and globally. Uh, in context of IP response to the full emergence of internet uh, technology. Existing provisions are not suited for dealing with digital transmissions of copyright works. Anti-piracy measures prescribed in the act are grossly inadequate in dealing with piracy in the network environment. Uh, no protection or rights management information or against a convention of uh, technological measures relating to online infringement uh, in form of new procedures for takedown of infringing materials. There is no provision, for instance, for liability of intermediaries in the digital network. Of course, these are just some of the, the important substantive areas that uh, really uh, guarantee robust protection for creative uh, industry uh, that Nigeria, uh, the Nigerian environment has provided on the continent. And of course, we 
are all witness to the uh, to the boosts and the uh, Nollywood revolution, the creative se the creative sector, the music uh, industry in Nigeria have really lacked the robust support that they should get from um, from the existing copyright uh, copyright uh, copyright uh, legislation. With respect to trademarks, we have. Um, the fact that there is no protection for service mark, for shapes and packaging, for sensory marks, uh, collective marks, collective marks, uh, non-traditional trade marks, domain names, and a host of you know, other new marketing strategies or models uh, for presenting uh, products, uh, goods, and services in the current um, commercial and technological environment. Today, for instance, we are now talking of IP's response to the challenges of big data to autonomous intelligence systems, remote and virtual technologies, 3D and all the rest uh, that has really defined the frontiers of innovation and technology. All of these are not really um, provided for protected in the current um, uh, copyright system in Nigeria. Now, the big elephant in the house, the lack of national IP policy, of course, that is something that has been a bane of IP development in Nigeria. Uh, considering the role of uh, an IP policy, um, which of course cannot, cannot be overemphasized in terms of defining the policy direction uh, for leveraging local copyright and innovation industry to support the national development goals. So that has been uh, one of the key issues uh, that is surrounding debates among scholars, among uh, policymakers in the country uh, currently. So for IP to perform that role of catalyst, for change in the knowledge driven in the knowledge driven economy and evidence based ip policy making uh, has been um, has been a unanimous and a unanimous voice among the uh, among the ip community in the country and um, lastly uh, in that area in terms of development is the slow pace of uh, ip law reform uh, across the three fields uh, very slow pace. Uh, I recall the IP law reform uh, started way back in the 90s um, with the copyright, the copyright field and of course extended to the industrial property field and today uh, we are still at the threshold of that reform. Um, two, three decades down the line we have not witnessed the kind of um, the type of IP system or IP law that we support the creative uh, and the innovation space uh, in the country. And that perhaps uh, remains the most pressing yet unresolved area of our development policy, our cultural economic development policy in the country. And it further demonstrates, you know, the imperative for IP reform in the country. Uh, with over two decades, like I said, um, we've only had uh, draft bills. Um, we had a draft bill of the most recent one, the draft copyright bill of 2015. And of course, we also have the draft industrial property bill even much earlier that have not uh, materialized in form of uh, legislation. So this has made it difficult, if not impossible, to adequately support um, and protect uh, IP and perhaps uh, one of the um, largest creative industry on the continent um, using the instrumentality of IP law to support those cultural industry in terms of um, how the works, the, in terms of the, ex, the, the, the scope of rights that the creators and innovators will enjoy under the, under the IP system. Now, um, I'll round up by saying clearly that the, the present realities uh, that we have uh, facing IP development in Nigeria uh, have significantly continue to expose the inadequacies and the gaps in the existing IP framework and, and have placed tremendous pressure on IP's ability to address a whole lot of important issues in the new knowledge era uh, within the, um, the, the, the space, within the Nigerian space, uh, such as the destructive impact of uh, new technologies um, the vastly changing commercial dynamics, uh, particularly e-commerce, uh, regulation of intermediaries, digital rights management mechanisms and enforcement, including the impact of global IP ecosystem that we have discussed here uh, um, in the last few minutes. 
protection of the local knowledge and local industry, uh, then balancing the tension between private rights and public interest and other development imperatives. Um, very quickly, I, I want to make a point with regards to this private-public interest uh, um, debate within the context of, I, of IP. The perception of inconsistency between strong IP rights and public welfare has continued to create uh, fundamental divisions and unwillingness to cooperate on issues that, that are important to the global innovation landscape. I believe very strongly that it is vital to promote uh, a framework for cooperation that fosters appreciation of our IP rights and policy sustainably address the pressing social problems of our time for which breakthroughs in innovation, particularly in these days uh, in the new normal uh, is key. Uh, in Nigeria today, uh, during the COVID era, we have seen an upsurge of uh, creative enterprise, innovative enterprise. Uh, some of our previous speakers have made allusion, allusions to that. Uh, in the creative industry, for instance, they are badly affected. Uh, we just held a, a, a webinar on the creative industry and the impact of uh, being at the, the, the filmmakers are not shooting films. They can't go on site. Uh, you can't uh, go to the cinema. And those are, th those are very, very important in terms of uh, the effect of the, of the COVID. Um, uh, on, on the creative industry, and they are not able to generate the, the revenue that is required. So they rely, for instance, on the, on the realities they will generate from collective management, which again, copyright provides that kind of support for. So in, in a large measure, uh, it is right to say that the creative industry rely on copyright system, even though we can say that um, in a lot of ways, they have revenue that are not particularly related or derived from copyright. But in situations like this, this is where copyright or IP system uh, um, come alive in, in, in ensuring their, their welfare and their protection as well. So lastly, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, two issues uh, are in the front burner in terms of the Nigeria specific IP development is concerned. Uh, the first issue that I would like to highlight and emphasize very clearly is the... Prof, I would uh, have to cut it short, so 30 seconds, please. Yeah, is the issue of the consensus surrounding uh, national IP policy. And that's something that is uh, that has been very, very clear among every stakeholder in the country. And secondly, the issue of uh, the slow pace of the uh, expected uh, IP law reform. Those two issues are very key. And, and very current in the development of IP in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. So now we'll quickly move to Dr. Lua Tobiloba Moody, who is going to give us the final point on WIPO in the Nigeria office. Thank you. And um, to all our participants, the chat function is now open. Please do send in questions that you have and we'll try to address it within the remaining minutes that we have. Thank you. You're on mute, Toby. Thank you. Just want to say thank you again to um, uh, Professor Gnati and um, Dr. Titi and uh, the whole Apronomics Law team. I mean, thank you so much for your great work, which is providing such a great resource for, for us all. Um, and just following on from the conversations, I also want to thank um, all the other speakers. I think you've given so much context to anything I can say. Um, Particularly, I want to just continue from um, Professor Adewapo's uh, um, um, points that has been made. And as Titi has said, I mean, I think my, my duty here will just be to speak um, particularly around Nigeria, but with an emphasis on the recently uh, established WIPO Nigeria office. As you will know, many of you may know, um, the WIPO Nigeria office was established um, in 2020, January this year. Um, and we launched our operations, yes, in January, um, even though the decision for the opening of the office has been taken since 2016. And so we've had two offices um, opened in Africa just over the past two years. Algeria was opened its office last year and um, Nigeria had its own doors open this year. Now, what I think I want to stress and at the end of my, my talk, um, I think I, I really wanted to come out loud is that there's a huge opportunity, I believe, 
for even for, for using um, this strategic location of these offices in Africa uh, for driving development possibilities um, across the con um, um, across the continent. And so I just feel that um, it's important in the light of our discussion today to also look at the role that a, a, a presence on the African continent for um, WIPO could could have in contributing to um, developmental possibilities uh, for Africa. I think um, I'll just say my, my comments, of course, will be limited um, within the context of, 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 of my institutional hat. Um, and I'll start by saying that one of the key reasons for an external office, um, particularly in, in, in Nigeria, um, has been to facilitate the use of IP for development. And that's one of the strategic goals of, the, of WIPO as an organization, um, which is provided for in its program and budget. And so most of the activities that we are engaging in, we want to also be showing them on a results framework that they are contributing to this key objective. Now there's some principles that external offices are meant to work with, such as adding value to what the organization does, um, operating efficiently and eff effectively, um, and avoiding duplication. And so as we would know, WIPO has already been working extensively in Africa, uh, particularly through its Africa Bureau that continues to work in Africa. And I need to stress at this point that the WIPO Nigeria office is not a regional office. It is a national office. So it is a WIPO Nigeria office. And most of its work is again, driven towards responding to the government of Nigeria's needs um, and priorities in, in, in intellectual property. However, we see that the national nature of its operations could also have a regional impact. And I think this is where um, the, the, the siting of an office uh, in Nigeria, in, in Algeria as well, could also be discussed you know, when we're, when we're thinking about um, these kind of um, broader African conversations. Um, I think there's also a need to operate on a sustainable basis. That's another principle that governs um, um, the excellent offices. And um, to ensure that our work is contributing, as I had mentioned, to the results framework and so of the organization as a whole. And so stressing on this, um, um, while there are num a number of strategic goals that the office is driven to, 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 to achieve, um, I think that I want to just keep, keep my comments on this strategic goal three, which um, centers on facilitating the use of IP for development. And I'll just give three quick examples of some of the work that we've been doing so far and work that I feel that going forward will also contribute uh, to, to this particular goal. Now, Professor Adewakbo uh, Professor had stressed on this IP policy, and I think it's something that continues, as he has rightly said, has continues to define most of the debates in Nigeria at this point around the need for a national IP policy, a coordinated structure, a coordinated approach to designing a future um, of IP development um, in Nigeria. And I know that a number of interest groups continue to lobby and continue to push and WIPO, the WIPO Nigeria office continues to support, especially its colleagues in the African Bureau who are working closely with the Nigerian government now on that process. And so there is a process for a national IP strategy that has been launched and is moving on. Um, even with the COVID, there have been alterations and, and my colleagues in, in, in Geneva with the Africa Bureau have been leading this process. But again, the WIPO Nigeria office sits in a place where it's able to support um, that. And I think that's something that um, in terms of delivery of services that we hope to see as a result in the few com in, in, in the coming um, in the nearest future. I also want to talk about the global infrastructure deployment and one of the benefits of having a regional or, or a, a national presence for um, for WIPO in Nigeria is that it's able to bring global services closer to the people. And I think that's something that we've been trying to work hard on in terms of raising awareness, but also deploying um, global infrastructure. And so one of the things we've done, we're, we're working on with our colleagues um, in Geneva, the global uh, infrastructures uh, uh, team, is to see how we can expand the network of technology and innovation support centers across the country. I think this is important for education. It's important for, um, and, I, and I really thank Jackie for her comments, which talked a lot about, you know, this, this, uh, this idea of, of I, I would call it like, she, 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 let me use her words, the frugal innovation. Um, and I think that there is an opportunity 
to use, um, to deploy these kind of um, and WIPO's services in this area to as many universities or institutions, research centers, and even informal sectors. And so working with groups of innovators or communities so that they are made aware of, um, you know, um, patent information and, and things that will help them as they try to engage with the IP system. Now, the third point that I'll just say before I wrap up is working closely with our colleagues in the WIPO Academy. And so we, we, we see a huge opportunity to improve or to build capacity um, across, um, across particularly, I would say, the youth and those who are coming up in the field of, of IP. And I, I really thank uh, Professor Caroline for her comments as well, and, and Desmond as well for their comments, which really hammer on this need for education and making um, access to, to, to resources because I do believe that if we can get it right with the upcoming generations then I think we will be able to have um, capacity, sufficient capacity to redefine our own priorities and realities I think uh, in, the, in the space of IP and so one of the things that we're trying to do with the WIPO Academy of course is to create more awareness about WIPO's courses, is to provide opportunities uh, for um, students. Um, we're trying to bring in a summer school as well into Nigeria. And um, we also we recently had a, a national IP essay competition, which again was partly driven to understand or just feel the temperature around students in tertiary institutions on these issues of IP. And the engagement has been brilliant. The responses have been brilliant. And I think these will help to redefine how we can position some of WIPO's services towards tertiary education in support of tertiary education in the country. Now, finally, I think a point that has been made as well already, which I will not belabor, is that there's a huge opportunity with the creative industries. And I think that's something that we continue to work closely with. The Beijing Treaty, for instance, was recently, recently entered into force on the 28th of April this year. And we've continued to work with, um, with, with the Copyright Commission, the Nigerian Copyright Commission, as well as um, key influencers in the Nollywood industry, just to understand and build up tangible um, 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 steps for implementing, for domestication, implementing of that even in Nigeria. And so with those few thoughts, I'm just going to say that I do believe that there is a huge opportunity for um, 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 utilizing the resource of a national office in Nigeria to drive development um, and create more awareness as well as build capacity um, in, in Nigeria, but on, in a broader scale broader um, um, context that will have key impact in Africa. Thank you very much. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Toby, for that. So intellectual property covers a broad scope, and we've been able to go around all of our panelists to touch on different subject matters. So finally, we we'll, would we'll open our floor now to questions and answers, and we already have questions that have been answered um, through through the chat function, but would invite David to give us some thoughts on the WHO and developments in Latin America. Thank you, Titi, and thank you all the editors for organizing this. I'm really glad to be here. So uh, I have four points that I would like to share with you today, just to finalize. Uh, the first one is that uh, actually the reality in Latin America is that we have a lot of uh, people death because of COVID-19, more than 129,000 cases. So almost as high as in the United States. So I guess my, my first point is that if we want to improve efficiency and accelerate the scientific progress, we need to work on equal access. And I highlight equal access because we, we need to make sure that this is actually affordable and available here in Latin America, the Caribbean, and also uh, in Africa. Um, uh, so to answer your question, TT, uh, the, the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, the CTAP initiative that was launched uh, on the uh, 15th of May, uh, I can tell you that we, we have now 39 countries that have endorsed this proposal so far, uh, in, including four European countries. Uh, the majority of, of these 39 countries are actually developing and least developing countries. Um, France, Germany, China, Japan, they uh, the solidarity call uh, to action yet. Um, as the, the Secretary General said, African countries should also have quick, uh, equal and affordable access. 
uh, to any eventual vaccine and treatment. And I guess the point I want to highlight here is that it is important to highlight this and consider this as a global public good. So that, that is why it is important to support this Costa Rican initiative uh, and to implement it with urgency. So my, my final two points, because uh, we, we are running out of time, but I will be glad to share these ideas uh, on writing for the next symposium, is that uh, actually a legal monopoly that allows for the uh, uh, monopoly of uh, transnational corporations bring uh, more inequality and less growth. So uh, there should be no more, more monopolies on patents and data and know how to treat this pandemic. And my final point will be, um, and I agree here with what Susan said before, we need to think of uh, alternative ways. So we need to start the discussion about reforming uh, the IP system in order to accelerate innovation and facilitate access for medicines here in Latin America and also in Africa and elsewhere. Um, I really like this idea of Susan about coming up with, uh, with, new, with new rules. So I'm glad uh, that she mentioned that as well. Uh, my, my final remark will be that uh, the compulsory licensing mechanism that you guys mentioned before has never been used in Colombia before, uh, not even the Article 73B. So I think there is, there is a need to, uh, to discuss more about the possibility of using this parallel importation flexibility and to work for tech transfers that will allow us to generate our own infrastructure and hopefully in Africa as well, so that we will have more autonomy uh, when it comes to, to this issue. So I thank you very much for, for this a couple of minutes, Titi, and uh, thank you very much to all the great editors of Afronomics. I, I look forward to, to the written symposium that you guys will organize at the end of, uh, of this month. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David, and thanks for already mentioning the written symposium. James would um, talk about that at the end. So now we'll go into broader questions that have been posed. One question is around compulsory licensing, Article 31Bs of the TRIPS Agreement, parallel importing. And I'll pose that question to Amaka. Would you please um, tell us, the, so there's a question from Thomas about the problems associated with compulsory licensing regimes um, established under Article 31Bs of TRIPS. Could you just expand on that, please, in one minute? So what's the question again? What are the main problems associated with compulsory licensing regime established under Article 31 Bs of TRIPS? The main problems? Yes. I know there are a lot of problems. You could just streamline to three problems, please. Um, basically, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing capacity, um, countries being able to uh, produce or license the, the, the drugs to a third party country to produce and send to them. Also like simple clarification because there are so many hurdles required when invoking compulsory license, you have to write to the WTO and whatnot. So there are so many hurdles um, involved in uh, issuing compulsory license so basically we have to streamline it to make it easy for countries to quickly use and to make sure that um, the rules and laws in place don't make it too cumbersome that it discourages countries um, from using. Also then there's the problem of um, special section 301 that the US tends to invoke whenever countries uh, decide to use compulsory license, but I have less than a minute, so yeah. But this is like the, the main ones, like the threat of U.S. invoking trade um, tra um, trade sanctions and whatnot. This is one, also one of the issues with with the article that that's one B. Thank you, Amaka. Excellent. Um, Adebombo, there's a question here that I would like to pose to you. With re respect to the need to reform intellectual property rules, what type of negotiating leverage can Africa tap into to bring into that? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, you know, that, that, brings, that brings to focus the, um, this whole debate about one size fits all uh, debate that we are all very familiar with uh, international relations or international IP field. And I think uh, developing countries or the global south now uh, is, is stronger than ever before to negotiate at the international table. I mean, stronger than 10 years ago, stronger than, uh, than 20 years ago. 
in all the uh, in all the tables, whether the w, uh, WTO or the w, uh, WIPO or any other any other sites. So I think it's important for uh, developing countries of the global uh, global south to now look at uh, the industry they can leverage on. Certainly, the cultural industries issues like TK um, issues like the uh, like for instance Nigeria's music industry or Nollywood or other industry that they have comparative advantage that they can advance their interest in negotiating uh, and optimizing um, their IP, IP rights, really. So I think that um, the stage is set, uh, the future of uh, developing countries in terms of IP uh, is stronger than before. And I think that that will be my general conclusion in that regard. Excellent, thank you so much. So my next question is from Gudrun, and it's about the AFCFTA. So the question is, a pre and this is to Susan, a prerequisite to create a, an AFCFTA IP regime is to have the technical facilities and know-how in the AFCFTA member states to maintain and administer the regime on the national level. Given the differences in development of the AFCFTA members, what are the approaches to ensure that all AFCFTA members would be in a position to implement the system? What are conceivable inter-African approaches to overcome this problem? Well, I'm, I don't have a, a direct answer what are the approaches, but I'll but I'll, I'll, I'll report what some regional uh, blocks are doing. Uh, I, I talk specifically to Comesa, the East African Community, and said that, as I said, because uh, they, they have a, a next year in themselves. Uh, just this morning, you know, yesterday I was asking actually one of the regional people, I said, but they've been this conversation about the uh, way forward for so many years. And he says, yes, and it will continue being there. And my answer was, then we should stop talking about it. <laughs> but that was just to pull his strings. The thing, as you rightly mentioned, the countries are at different levels of development. So what some countries are doing, and I think that's really is something to salute, at least the East African communities, to do what they are calling approximation of laws, of regimes, as opposed to harmonization. Because there will always be tension, there will always be disagreement. But if they approximate, like meaning they bring the laws and the rules as close to each other as possible, then they will, one can hope that there will be disagreement. I mean agreement. Of course, there are political interest, there are other challenges which and we are not able to fix here. We can only say what we hope and what we think can be workable, explorable. That's all I, I can give. And I think I saw another question saying there's actually been this talk for a long time and there's been no harmonization, precisely that countries have different interests but also they have different capacities. So I think trying approximation is one one approach, forcing countries to, to give them a kind of a template or a law to say, now you all have to fit in this. It's like having the one size fits all we, Professor De, uh, De Wop has just spoken about. Not every country will fit in, and then what will happen is countries will just refuse to be part of the process. So we have to find some kind of a, a middle way. Thank you so much, Susan. That was excellent. So we have a question now about traditional knowledge, and I'll pose this to Jackie and um, Toby, if you're comfortable. So is traditional knowledge protection and the prevention of biopiracy addressed in Africa? TRIPS, by many, is considered one of the most unjust international trade regimes, and their problematic aspects, including the free trade, free trade agreements. Um, so can we to think about the protection of traditional medicines and biopiracy in Africa. We'll start with Jackie. And we could link that to social innovation as well. You're on mute, please. I want to throw this to Toby so that I can take the next question by Perpetua. Okay. Toby, yeah. and I'm putting you on the spot now with your traditional knowledge hat on. Gotcha. Toby, if that's okay. All right, just let me get my video on. 
Thank you. Sorry, I think I missed aspects of the question. If I got it right, is traditional knowledge protection being addressed in Africa? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, what I would say is that I think um, that first, let me just talk about um, WIPO's engagement. And as we all know, that the ongoing Intergovernmental Committee on Intellectual Property and Genetic Resources, Traditional Knowledge and Folklore continues to meet to discuss, um, you know, an international instrument or instruments in that area. And so I think at the global level that we have seen that there is a lot of push towards an instrument um, that will address that problem. Now, one of the key demanders in those discussions are definitely African countries. And so it's important to see that, um, that a kickback or something that had come up in a lot of the discussions before has been um, evidence. And there's been a push in the, in the renewed mandates of could you provide some evidence of, of these in practice, of how are you addressing this um, um, in, in Africa and so, or in, 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 in countries. So it's not just Africa, but key demanders were, were, were put on the spot towards that end. And I think what we've seen is that a number of countries have taken this forward and have been driven to try to implement national strategies around traditional knowledge. Um, Kenya is a very good example of a country, for instance, that has developed its national strategy on protecting traditional knowledge um, and also has come up with its uh, um, 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 legislation to that effect. Um, we see a lot of other countries in Africa, I believe, also pushing towards having some kind of um, a national approaches towards protecting traditional knowledge. And I also want to mention the work of the AU in this regard. And so the African Union has also come up with um, its um, guide, guidelines, uh, both strategic and practical, um, that would help with the implementation of you know, the Nagoya Protocol, basically. But again, in a broader sense, trying to say, let's have a coordinated approach in Africa towards addressing or looking at this problem of traditional knowledge. And so I just want to say that there is traction on the issue in Africa. I don't think it's right there, uh, perfect yet, but there is work going on. And I do believe that there's still areas for improvement. And I do see it's an, an area that, again, I think uh, uh, some of the offices of WIPO in Africa could also contribute to facilitating those kind of discussions on the continent. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we'll quickly go to Jackie now, and that would also be your closing statement. So you could address Perpetua's question. Um, yes. So Perpetua said that we are encouraging a shift in the traditional IP system, while the now educated youth want to take advantage of the IP system as it is. So um, as a Kenyan, I understand Perpetua's um, perspective. And I think the reason that we are seeing this trend is because IP law is particularly under theorized and understudied in Kenya. Unlike um, a jurisdiction like South Africa that has developed more into trying to find the public interest aspects of IP law. So I know that um, South Africa has you know, it may not be sufficient, but they've done more work on flexibility on copyright, especially, and fair use. But Kenya keeps tightening its IP laws every single time that I, that reform of IP law is, is done. And we now have an IP bill that, you know, just as a glance at it, we can tell that Kenya is trying to you know, I guess it's playing a political game of, you know, IP being more accumulating more patents means that you're more innovative unfortunately and um so it's a trend that that kenya is propagating the government and uh, you know policy makers kenya copyright board kenya industrial property institute it's um it's the ideology that we have but that does not mean that all innovators are driven by the same um thinking there are those who actually recognize that you know they they can they can also you know make sales without necessarily um, utilizing the intellectual property system and I think if we studied some more and learned you know educated innovators some more on the you know the empirical work that has been done on um, how industries rely on other aspects other than IP to, you know, to, to make money, then they would also probably not waste 
you know, the resources that they spend on, you know, getting patent protection, for instance, you know, if it's not going to be, um, I see Titi is nodding, she wants, yes, oh, yeah. if it's not going to be recouped, then excellent. it will not always be uh, profit, profitable to do so. Okay, so next we'll quickly go to Emmanuel for his closing 30 seconds line. Uh, thank you, Titi. Um, I just want to say thank you to I mean, you again and uh, Professor Gassi for the invitation. It's been an interesting afternoon for me. And um, I hope that all the other participants have, I mean, all the other participants have also had a good time. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Amaka, next. So Ted, you're on mute, please. I think um, going, going forward, um, we need to move the discussion away from uh, Africa, uh, the global south, depend, de and depending on the global north for as as assistance and help. When this is over, we need to uh, find a way to, when the next pandemic comes, because if you listen to epidemiologists and public health uh, professionals, they keep saying that this is the beginning of many more pandemics that is coming because we are encroaching into spaces that humans are not supposed to because of, you know, capitalism and whatnot. So if that is the case, we need to start thinking of how we can best protect our needs and make sure that in case the next one comes, well, next, we are well prepared um, to take care of ourselves. So that means investing in research and development, investing in uh, pharmaceutical technology and pharmaceutical education in Africa, um, research labs in Africa, uh, developing manufacturing capacity within Africa, in Africa, even in Global South, encouraging South-South partnership and coordination with other um, Global South countries that have um, advanced technological and uh, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical technology like India and Brazil and, and China, making sure that these are shared with other Global South countries. Thank you. So we'll move on to Susan now. We could have that in the written symposium more on the discussion. So Susan, please, 30 seconds. Oh, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> 30 seconds closing line. If you oh, close, closing line. Yeah, I would close by responding to uh, something that was post or a, a comment. Should Africa come up with laws or rules are different from what is at international level, completely new and ignore that's not what I was saying. No, it's not wise because many Africans are also party to so many other arrangements, especially trade. So one, they'll get repercussions. Two, we still need to trade. But what I'm saying, there's a need to look at the technology we have. There's the capacity, which maybe we are ignoring and just looking out and trying to get all the time. And then that's how we get abused. There's capacity on the continent, which needs to be developed. Thank you. Excellent. Caroline, we'll go next to you. And thank you so much for answering many of the comments in the chat function. <laughs> great. So thank you very much. Um, uh, that's all I wanted to say, that I've had great fun um, interacting with some of the questions on the Q&A. And, you know, if only we had more time, we've been going for two hours. But I think that all of us here are, are so enthused about it that we could go for longer. But obviously we cannot. So <laughs> thank you. Um, to you, Titi, and the rest of the team, and for everybody who's lasted the course. Thank you very much. I hope we can continue these conversations offline. Thank you so much, Caroline, and I definitely know that we will continue the conversation. So next, we'll go to Desmond, please. 30 seconds. Okay, so I'll close by, again, appreciating the organizers, I mean, uh, uh, the, the Aphonomics Law Block team, and the, for the opportunity uh, um, given me to participate in this webinar. And also to say that um, one thing the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to the fore is our common humanity and the need to ensure that both able and disabled persons are you know, carried along as uh, governments, both at national, regional, and international levels, craft laws and policies you know, relating to education. It is important that everybody is dragged along. It is important that disabled persons are also dragged along. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. Excellent. Thank you so much. Next, we'll move to Adibambo. And he would also address Nkem's question on Nollywood. I didn't get that question. I wasn't. What's so in question? respect to the, um, so could you just talk about the Nollywood industry that thrives without enforcement of intellectual property or copyright? So oh, okay. we didn't have copyrights, but Nollywood thrived. 
Okay. Um, first of all, let me just quickly thank Professor Gathi, uh, Dr. Adebola, and the whole team for putting this together. I really appreciate it, and I really had a good time um, in this conversation. Um, Nollywood, I mean, I know the, the, the debate, the point being made about Nollywood uh, not being supported by, by IP and yet thriving. I think that, that debate, that, that point is right. At the same time, um, you can look at it from two perspectives. The first one is the one, the point that has been made. But I would like to address the second point, which is that, for instance, uh, some of the rights that are enjoyed by the, um, by the creatives in that industry derives from copyright, for instance. So they have an additional layer of, of rights, an additional layer of income or revenue that you can derive from IP. So it's not completely as if they, are, they have not gained anything from, from the IP system. I, I agree, they, they made a lot of rights selling the movies and uh, without strong enforcement. But even at that, uh, the Copyright Commission over the years have also supported them in, uh, in embarking on enforcement of, of their works in Alaba, and all of that. But the major challenge will be the digital piracy, which is the different issue entirely. So I agree, I agree, the point has been made. But again, you have to look at the other side. Now, my final point, I think we need to strike a balance, I mean, broadly speaking, between, uh, between private rights and public interest. And I think that's the challenge, not just for the global uh, South, but also for the global North, for the entire, uh, the two spheres of, um, of the world to strike an effective, uh, a strategic balance between the private rights system and public interest. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Toby, final word, please. Uh, um, thank you. I just want to say a very big thank you to the organizers, Professor Gaffey and Dr. Adebola and all the other speakers. It's been a great honor um, being on the same panel with you. And I think like the lessons, we want to take these forward and look forward to the written sy symposium very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Toby. And I'll leave the floor now to Professor Gathi to end. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Debola. Um, uh, first, I'd like to thank our audience for being very patient. Uh, as all our speakers have noted, we could go on quite a bit. Uh, so thanks for your patience. Thanks to, to our speakers for your very thoughtful um, comments. Uh, I know it takes a lot to prepare even for a very brief intervention like you all made and uh, you are great. Uh, like uh, Professor Ruth Okiriji noted, uh, uh, I can only uh, say as well uh, that there's a great depth of uh, IP expertise on the continent and, and the, in the global south generally. Uh, and it's great to see us all together discussing these important uh, issues. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dabola, for putting this together and for your expert moderating. Um, uh, I think, like you said, Dr. Dabola, this is not the end of this conversation. We are looking forward to a symposium, a written symposium on the blog. Um, and in fact, we have even bigger plans uh, because, uh, like you all noted, this is not a discussion that will end with uh, blog posts. As you know, we are launching uh, before too long the first issue of the African Journal of International Economic Law. It would really be great to have just an issue focused on this issue relating to the Global South. Um, and so I ask you to think about that. Um, maybe it's here yeah, to have that in So uh, I see Amaka is smiling. Uh, uh, and everybody seems to be in agreement that this is a possibility. You know, you have 12 months from now. Uh, I think that we need to carry forward that conversation in our own forums, on our own terms. And uh, you have all shown today that this is really possible. Uh, so again, thank you very much uh, for all your interventions. Uh, for this very rich conversation. Uh, as you know, on the blog right now, we have a great symposium going on on human rights and business uh, from a due diligence perspective uh, in English, in Portuguese, and in Spanish. Uh, on Wednesday, we have another major symposium uh, organized by uh, convened by Dr. Alexander Nzangu on, uh, in, no, I'm going to mispronounce his name, uh, uh, on taxation and the social contract in a post-pandemic era. Uh, 
and uh, I invite you to uh, take a look at it. We have more than 20 excellent uh, postings uh, from lots of voices from around the world. And uh, the role of the blog is to convene all these voices uh, to create a narrative about these important issues that are of concern to us. We shall soon be announcing our next webinar. Uh, and lastly, I will, uh, I cannot end this by, without thanking our team here at Loyola University of Chicago, Nick and Julia for uh, hosting us with all the technology and all the support. Uh, so until next time, everybody, thank you so much. Uh, it was a great pleasure having you and we look forward to continuing this conversation in other forums. Um, and so have a good evening, good night, or good day, wherever you are. Uh, we are really, truly grateful for uh, being with us uh, for this webinar. So thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. <laughs>